HDMI 2.1 monitors are coming thick and fast and that's exactly what we have on review today. It's the BenQ Mobius EX3210U, a 4K 144Hz IPS monitor that has HDR600 certification among a few other features. In this review you can see if it's actually worth its price tag because in the UK it can be found for a whopping £1,100 and in the US it can be found for $1,100. So jumping straight in, the monitor does indeed have full bandwidth HDMI 2.1 ports and a singular display port input. Now the latter is useful if you have a PC setup and therefore you'll be able to benefit from 144Hz at 4K. But of course, if you do want to run over HDMI, you're not going to be limited, although you will be running at 4K at 120Hz instead. So with that in mind, I was very much intrigued to put it through its paces. First off, with some objective testing in terms of its input lag, I had it tested at 3 milliseconds. And not only for a monitor of its class, but indeed of other monitors out there on the market, this monitor does compete with some of the very lowest input lag monitors out there on the market, at least from ones I've actually tested. And therefore means it's actually perfect for those people who are going to be running a console with a controller, for example, or indeed a mouse and keyboard setup, be it on a console or indeed on a computer. In my case, I was playing some Counter-Strike Global Effect and had no problems when it came to registering inputs via my mouse clicks. Now while its input lag is very impressive, its response time couldn't be quite as praised. In my case, I actually found it to be a little bit sluggish, specifically in comparison to other 4K 144Hz monitors out there on the market, with or without HDMI 2.1. Now in this respect, I found that the AMA Level 2 resulted in the best sort of visual and indeed performance of the monitor, whereby here, running on AMA Level 3 resulted a bit too much inverse ghosting for my liking. It's almost like level AMA 2.5 would have been perfect, but of course the option is not available. Now what I will say over here is on the UFO ghosting test, you'll be able to see that I not only tested it at 4K 144Hz over DisplayPort, but I also tested it at 120Hz at 4K over DisplayPort and HDMI. And I wanted to do this test just in case for people who are wondering how it would perform over console or indeed over a different input, and I can safely say there's no sort of differences when it came to the overall visual experience. As such, AMA Level 2 will probably result the best sort of experience for a lot of gamers out there. Now as for the blur reduction mode, I had it tested at the 4K 144Hz mode and here you can definitely see that the UFOs are much more visible and it definitely has a positive impact in terms of the overall visual experience. But of course here when it comes to response time, the AMA setting is the one that you're going to be wanting to dial up or down. Now just to round up that section, I just want to say that the response response time isn't quite suitable for Twitch based FPS gamers like myself who play Counter Strike quite religiously. But if you're someone who's going to be playing more sim based racing or something a little bit more casual then I think the response time setting specifically on the AMA level 2 will definitely suffice for a lot of gamers. Now a quick little note on the blur reduction mode that I just referenced, I should just bear in mind here that it will limit the peak brightness and we'll touch upon peak brightness further down in this review in the image quality section. But elsewhere it will run simultaneously with AMD FreeSync and or NVIDIA G-Sync. In my case I was able to test the latter and had no problems running NVIDIA G-Sync simultaneously at 4K 144Hz with blur reduction enabled, which is a great sort of feature. However, if you do have an HDR signal, the blur reduction feature does get disabled and blanked out. Be it if you're running NVIDIA G-Sync or AMD FreeSync on or off, blur reduction will simply not run with HDR simultaneously at 4K at 144Hz or indeed 120Hz. Now this perfectly leads me onto its VRR technology and while I couldn't test for AMD FreeSync, I was able to run the NVIDIA Pendulum demo on my RTX 3080 whilst connected over DisplayPort with no issues. No sort of black screen problems or indeed flickering. Elsewhere I was able to better the experience by going at 4K at 144Hz in Destiny 2 and also simultaneously running Nvidia G-Sync and HDR which made for a great tear-free gaming experience. So what about when it comes to its HDR performance? Well here the monitor is rated at display HDR 600 and therefore should hit over 600 nits. However from my own test and the monitor that I had I was not able to hit anything above 516 nits. 
So therefore it just get me a little bit baffled as to how the 600 nits measurement was actually achieved by BenQ. And this is coming from someone who's reviewed over 200 different monitors, so I was very much trying to do all different sorts of setups, but I couldn't get it to hit that peak brightness. Now I should mention over here that if you do want to get the best sort of HDR experience, you're definitely going to want to enable the backlight control. There's a setting when you have HDR enabled, you'll have a backlight control which you can enable or disable. Now this means you'll get deeper blacks and just a little bit of better image, and therefore means that the monitor is constantly adjusting the image as it goes. The only thing to bear in mind however is that you've only got 16 local dimming zones and as a result won't quite compete with monitors that had a full array local dimming or indeed a greater number of local dimming zones and as such would provide you a better or superior HDR experience. So with the gaming section out of the way we get onto image quality. Now this monitor has got a 32 inch IPS panel and it also has a dedicated sRGB emulation mode that can be selected through the OSD. Now via my calibrators I actually had it tested at a gamut coverage of 94.9% on the sRGB spectrum and 97.7% on gamut volume. Do bear in mind the box below it because we'll be switching to the standard mode very soon. As for the average Dell TE, it's not too great at 1.5 with a maximum of 6.04. Some of its competitors do a far better job in this department. Similarly, when it comes to its tested contrast ratio, 776 to 1 isn't that impressive. Even though we're talking about an IPS panel in comparison to a VA panel, I was expecting a faster superior result. Its measured white point on the plus side is pretty good at 6725 Kelvin at 100% and similarly its 2.2 gamma curve is pretty much on point. Now bear this in mind because now we've switched over to the standard mode and first off let's talk about that gamma. It's absolutely gone AWOL towards the higher brightness levels. I don't know what on earth is going on over here but it just seemed to go absolutely ballistic. I tried it a variety of different times and tried doing a multitude of different runs and each time the gamma resulted in such a weird different curve. I think BenQ should really potentially address this. Now as for the measured white point it was 6868 Kelvin at 100% which is perfectly acceptable. Now it's no surprise that this sRGB average Del T E and maximum Del T E are far worse and this is because the monitor has no longer got that emulation mode and it's still trying to hit against the sRGB standard. As a result it goes up to 4.83 whereby higher is worse and the maximum sits at 12.95. As for the gamut coverage you can see over here that it does surpass the sRGB standard and actually goes towards the Adobe RGB and DCI-P3 standards doing a decent job across both. Now while some of these things that I've mentioned will definitely concern some enthusiasts. What will concern the majority of consumers however is this overall brightness and specifically when it comes to its SDR brightness. Now BenQ have this rated at 300 nits but in my case I had it tested at 252 nits at its maximum SDR brightness. Minimum gets down to 48 nits which is quite good. Now as for its HDR brightness with backlight control on you'll get up to 516 nits at least with the monitor that I have and with the backlight control off this drops significantly to around 400 nits, so something to be mindful about. As for the blur reduction brightness that I mentioned before, it gets to 173 nits as maximum and a minimum of 47 nits. Ultimately, my real main concern over here when it comes to brightness is the fact that the monitor isn't bright enough in terms of its SDR brightness, which I suspect many people will be using it on in certain scenarios. You're not going to be always running an HDR signal. And this means that not only is blur reduction mode that limits the overall brightness, but also just a general SDR brightness might not suffice for a lot of consumers who are going to be running this monitor in a bright sunlit room. Now a complete contrast to what I've just mentioned over here is the overall brightness uniformity, which you'll be able to see over here isn't too bad at least on my tested panel. Of course this is somewhat panel lottery. As for the backlight bleed it's also pretty impressive. You can see here there's a little bit of bleed towards the corners but it's quite minimal. Specifically for a IPS 32 inch panel I was expecting it to be a lot worse but that wasn't the case with this BenQ and I must say I was pretty impressed in this department. So moving on to the monitor's OSC can be accessed through a little physical joystick button which is quite handy towards the bottom of the monitor. Better still you've got a wireless remote which is very handy handy to use. Now through the OSD menu itself you've got the input select which of course is very self-explanatory but then you've got three separate modes to choose within this and then the scenario modes. It's a little bit confusing but effectively you want to leave the scenario mode enabled and then depending on terms of what you're actually using, be it from cinema, standard or game, you can select between these modes. Frankly between these three it doesn't actually make a difference, it's just a way of differentiating three separate settings. Likewise with the quick menu it's just for you to customize as to 
what is actually being shown in terms of when you first launch up the OSD. Now as for the color modes, you want to go potentially on the custom mode. Do bear in mind the comments I made before. And here I have the light tuner at level one, the color vibrance one notch down at level nine. Brightness will definitely um, depend on your own ambient light conditions. The sharpness I leave at level five, BI plus, you can enable it or disable it. In my case, I do leave it disabled. Gamma level three, color temperature on normal and AMA level two. Of course, all of these I have mentioned before. As for the blur reduction, yet again, you can enable or disable it over here. Although yet again, it cannot be enabled simultaneously with HDR, but can work simultaneously with AMD FreeSync or indeed NVIDIA G-Sync, which is very handy. Of course, other than that, you can go through the different modes. You can see over here, it does black it out. And over here, for example, we've got sRGB mode, which does lock quite a few other options, such as let's say the blur reduction. So I would suggest most people will probably want to run on the custom mode. Although if you do want that better sRGB color accuracy, you'll want to go for the sRGB mode. Now for the eye care, you do have the BI plus sensor and then low blue light mode and color weakness, and you can adjust by duration, which is all very handy. As for audio, it's actually got some very impressive speakers. It's got a 2.1 channel configuration where you've got two two watt speakers and one five watt woofer. The overall result is actually really impressive. Now you can adjust the volume through the OSD and you can choose the different EQ presets. I would suggest running on the pop live mode to get the best sort of audio reproduction. And then you have got the microphone where you've got a few different settings as well. And here is a little demo of it. Now indeed the BenQ motor has got built in microphones and here I'm just facing the monitor itself so it gives you a bit more of an accurate reproduction. And there's a green LED which shows up towards the front of the monitor to show when it's actually on, which is a useful privacy feature. Now the sensitivity will be very much depending on your own room's acoustics and of course how loud you actually want to be. I'm running it on level eight right now. As for the polar pattern, you have got the private mode which we're on right now, but you can go for the omnidirectional mode which will then pick up a little bit more environmental sound. I suspect most people won't want to run this mode even though it sounds a little bit better because here it will pick up, let's say, the sounds of a mechanical keyboard a little bit more than the private mode, at least from my own tests. Now for the noise cancellation feature, I do find it a little bit odd where the level three, level two and level one modes work relatively well, but level zero mode has got an odd sound. Specifically, if you go quiet, so I'd very much suggest leaving that enabled or, for example, leaving it on the level three mode. Now, what I will say is that the built-in microphones are a great addition. However, they're no competition to a dedicated microphone. And just for comparison, here's my wired mod mic, which is connected up to a cheap USB sound card. And hopefully you'll be able to agree with me that the overall sonic reproduction of my mod mic is far superior than what the BenQ is able to achieve. Now, moving back onto the OSD, you do have lighting controls whereby you can enable or disable them, choose between the colors, or for example, go via a spectrum, which will disable the color controls. Now, the RGB light aren't exactly bright enough to be seen in most scenarios so I suspect most people will actually leave them disabled like myself. Now as for the system you have got the ability to disable the LED indicator which relies towards the bottom of the monitor and then you can also find some information of the resolution and the refresh rate that the monitor is currently running on. Now with the OSD and a few of its features out of the way I should also comment about its stand and here it's very sturdy and provides a height, tilt and pivot adjustment although it cannot be rotated something to be mindful about. Thankfully, you can have a Visa compatible stand so you can have a full sort of ergonomic feel to it via a monitor arm or indeed put it on a multi-monitor setup. On that note, the monitor has got a three side boardless design and means that it won't take up too much space on your desk. Elsewhere, the actual built-in stand itself, should you choose to use it, has got an orange trim, which I do find a little bit fascinating, very much like a few of the older BenQ Mobius line out there on the market, and also has got a white finish, which actually very much differentiates itself from a lot of other gaming monitors out there on the market. And on that note, it perfectly leads me onto my verdict, where the BenQ monitor does have a few unique features, such as the microphone, the speakers, or for example, the stand and design. However, it fundamentally falls short when it comes to raw image quality or gaming performance. See here if you want a 4K 144Hz 32 inch monitor with HDMI 2.1, I would definitely suggest looking at the Asus PG32UQ, which offers all of this and also comes in at £250 cheaper, at least in the UK and at the time of filming. As a result, makes the BenQ Mobius very hard to recommend. 
Elsewhere, if you don't need HDMI 2.1, you might want to consider some alternatives. So for example, if you're a PC gamer looking to achieve this resolution and refresh rate, you might want to look in the description below whereby you can save yourself a pretty penny. There is of course some other suggestions out there, for example 1440p monitors that you might also want to consider, and that's because 4K 144Hz will be quite hard to push out, be it if you've got a beefy graphics card in your computer, or indeed if you've got a latest generation console. Now if you've enjoyed this detailed independent review, definitely do drop a like, subscribe and hit that bell notification, all of which are greatly appreciated. And if you've done that already, I just want to thank you in advance. As such, I've been Tony Dubs and I'll hopefully see you in the next one. Take care of yourselves and goodbye.